On today's World Insight, China-U.S. ties have reached their most tense in decades. Where does this distrust come from, and can it be reversed? Where the anti-China feeling came from, okay, it, it was almost entirely driven by Trump. And tea, philosophy, and a beautiful yard. A deep and delightful conversation with David Bartosz fills us in. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. Can China and the United States coexist peacefully, or are they heading towards a so-called new Cold War? Those are the questions repeatedly asked by many. Last Friday marks the 50th anniversary of Dr. Henry Kissinger's secret visit to China, which paved the way for bilateral relations. But what is even more relevant is how the future will look like for the bilateral relations. On this, earlier I talked to Peter Walker, an expert on China-U.S. relations. He's the author of the book, Powerful, Different, Equal, Overcoming the Misconceptions and Differences Between China and the U.S. Peter has visited China more than 80 times and met a wide range of people from this part of the world. His frequent visits made him realize that there's a split in the narrative about the real China. Here's our talk. And I'm so glad to be joined by Peter Walker. Mr. Walker, what a pleasure to see you. Yeah, pleasure is all mine. Looking forward to it. You know, the so-called China threat has been a rallying factor for both political parties to come together and also has been invented as a way uh, to rally the crowd inside the United States because of the domestic uh, difficulties now. But will that be the right way for the U.S. to rally the crowd for, you know, beyond this year, let's just say, mid and long term, uh, because some would argue from this part of the world that there will be misperception being formed and advocated by some using that as a political tool, and then that would lead to uh, the miscalculation. And the miscalculation, once it continues, it will further feed into misconceptions and probably even more. So we're seeing a yeah. vicious cycle of that. At least that's what many here in this part of the world think about what is going on in the U.S. and what is the goal of the rhetorical war that's going on right now. Well, yeah, but let, let's go back to where the anti-China feeling came from. Okay. It was almost entirely driven by Trump. Why was it driven by Trump? Because Trump realized when COVID hit that his, quote, terrific economy uh, was going to start taking a real hit because he did not take COVID seriously. People are looking at the track record already in more than five months, and they say, hmm, things are not getting better, not as earlier expected before the current person coming into the office, and things are getting, in some areas, even worse. Yeah, but, but And look, some policies look, of Trump administration continues. The latest China protested. 500 Chinese students that are in the major of science and technologies and others going to the United States, their visa being denied. Of course, the... This is a, one of those many examples that we're seeing today. Yeah, but, but you, you have to go, first of all, Biden went on record a number of years ago of saying China is not the enemy. And, and Biden was very steep in foreign affairs, spent time with Xi, he understands China very well. So, so the reason China, that Biden has to take the positions he's taking today, which are tougher than anyone expected, is because he's trying to get his domestic agenda focused on infrastructure and improving the social safety net through Congress. And the Republicans can't wait for him to, quote, appear to be soft on China. So he's doing the opposite. But it's only rhetoric. 
But I think you're going to start to see real progress on trade. You're going to see real progress on a wide range of fronts. You've already seen him take some of the executive orders from Trump, like on TikTok, and reverse them. Uh, there's, they're taking a fresh look at the whole issue of, is China a military threat? Mm. So I think what you're going to see with Biden is a steady movement towards engagement with China, which you did not have with Trump and you did not have with Pompeo. And, and you're going to see compromises because... But comparing to Trump, human, that's a quite a low is, denominator, isn't it? Well, it, it's, yeah, I mean, I mean, Trump did not engage China, let's be clear. I mean, he unilaterally put in place the trade war, which was a lose-lose, which all of the economists said from day one. You know, Mr. Walker, I want to be polite here. And we understand that, you know, uh, because... Uh, of the political situation that uh, Trump is being blamed by many things, and rightly so, but one could argue politicians did not originally desire to do that, but with the current political situation, they have to do that. But once the toxic environment is getting ever worse, how will the politicians not follow their you know, election instinct, but rather follow what, they, what many could consider as the right path? And that, to me, will be very interesting from your argument. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's clear that a lot of the politicians are going to use the uh, China card as a way to argue that, you know, they ought to get elected or reelected. At, at the end of the Not day, the, current the, administration? Reality, that, the, the reality is if the, the U.S. can badmouth China all at once, it doesn't affect what happens in China. China has a game plan. It's acting on that game plan. Mm. Its economy is moving ahead in a much faster recovery rate than in the U.S. It's not going to be about the military. So increasingly, the U.S. is realizing that the U.S. is suffering from self-inflicted wounds. The fact that we haven't invested in infrastructure and that we haven't invested in basic science uh, has nothing to do with China. It's, it has been the polarization in Washington over the last couple, over the last decade. Mm. And, and so you, you can argue, which is my strong feeling, is that China should keep doing what it's doing. It works. It has a strong track record. And, and the U.S. is increasingly recognizing these self-inflicted wounds. So you're now starting to see, you know, there was a big bill passed in Congress of investing over a hundred billion dollars in basic science. I see. Why? To catch up with China. And and so the China bashing is noise that's largely driven by the media in the US and by politicians. And and it's just noise. I mean there's no real consequence to it. The consequence was like the trade war and that's going to get unraveled because it hurt mm -hmm. China and it, the US even more. Mr. Walker, history was not, you know, just made overnight, even though there were some of those uh, historical occasions that really changed the world. But if you look at the Cold War, it didn't happen uh, right after the Second World War. It was rather uh, a deteriorating situation so geopolitically over 10 to 15 period of time that has led to where the world was then. Uh, the Cold War started, escalated. Um, so how, how do you see, you know, today China and the United States not necessarily on the verge of a Cold War? Where does that come from? Well, look, I, I mean, today we are in a Cold War. I would attribute it 90 percent to the fact that Trump made it a Cold War by blaming China for the loss of blue collar jobs in the U.S., which frankly had little to do with China, had everything to do with the role of technology in eliminating blue-collar jobs. And then he mm -hmm. also blamed China for the flu. But at, at the end of the day, the facts are pretty clear. Uh, pandemics are, you know, come from unusual sources that are not predictable. The only variable in a pandemic is how you respond. Mm -hmm. China responded aggressively, and it has had its economy bounce back much faster and with a tiny fraction of the deaths that the U.S. occurred. The U.S. incurred 600,000 deaths so far, and we're still threatened because the people are refusing to get vaccinated. Yeah. 
So, you know, at, at, the, at the end of the day, um, I think it's going to come down to the hard facts and increasingly the public uh, are, 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 increased, are going to recognize those facts. And, and China is going to continue to grow its economy, work on its advanced technologies and BRI, and it's, and, and it's got a totally aligned team against it. And the, and the question is, for the U.S., how is the U.S. going to respond? Biden wants to respond by investing in the future, which I think is the right answer. But he's running up against Republicans who really are basically focused on maintaining the status quo for the relatively well-to-do and wealthy mm -hmm. of the U.S. And, uh, so you've got two diametrically opposed visions of what the U.S. ought to be doing. Mr. Walker, you have been a business person. You frequent China almost four to six weeks uh, every time you come to China. Um, you see the changes of this country. But right now, um, it seems that the businesses at this critical moment when exchanges between the two countries are getting ever more or less, shall we put it that way, uh, business ties are extremely important. Tell me more about how independent businesses should be on both sides so that they would serve as a bridge uh, between the two sides? Well, look, I, I think that's really one of the most important opportunities for both the U.S. and China to come together. At the, at the end of the day, the people in Washington know very little about China. They use it for political purposes. If you were to ask the average congressman to answer even basic questions about the history and culture of China, or how its model is different, they can't answer that. If you were to ask most people in the media the same questions, they're not factually driven. They don't understand. They're taking points of view that are popular for people who buy their product. So the group in the US that really understands China are the businesses who have been working with China either in a supply chain sense or they're in China in the China market. Uh, they understand that uh, China has an agenda, and if you as a private company don't understand China's agenda and the five-year plan, you're out of sync with what's going on in China, and you're not going to be successful. The challenge for the businesses is China has become so politicized by the government and the media that they're cautious about getting becoming too vocal. Mm -hmm. But I think China and Biden would do a huge service to the relationship if they in, encourage more uh, back and forth and cooperation among the businesses. Because America has a lot to add in value to businesses in China, and China has a lot to add to businesses in the U.S. And they're both huge markets. So it, business could be a real win-win for both sides. But unfortunately, the voice of business in the U.S. today is not getting heard. Hopefully that will change. You don't think they're going to be muffled in the longer term? I think Biden sees the business community as an ally of the U.S. and an important asset of the U.S. And I think he's going to look to help businesses be successful around the world. He understands the trade war was a terrible mistake. And he's going to unravel it. It's not going to happen overnight, but it will happen on a step-by-step -step basis. You know, there has been a lot of respect from this part of the world about the American system. Uh, and also about the soft power uh, of the United States. And yet, with the past few years, which that process is still going on right now in the eyes of the Chinese, um, it seems to be rather than a reality, but a myth of the so-called the American uh, dream and American legend um, and the American value. Uh, because people see a lot of real um, behind the back stabbing uh, by either the politician or the current regulations against China and the Chinese individuals. So, um, so the whole taste and the whole foundation, one could say, of the relationship 
particularly between the two peoples, could be changed. Uh, Mr. Walker, maybe it's a little bit of exaggeration in the description, but what's your thought about that? No, I, I think you've described it fairly accurately. You know, you, you have to go back in history. Uh, the reality is the U.S. was blessed in its history by a number of factors. The U.S. never had enemies on its border that mattered. I mean, they fought the Mexicans, but at the end of the day, the outcome was pretty much preordained. They never had to fight on their borders, really. Um, secondly, they had great natural resources. So in terms of water and energy and climate and arable land, everything was uh, was for the benefit of the Americans. Uh, and third, they had a huge immigrant influx from Europe of pretty talented people who wanted to work hard and get ahead. And they've been in many ways the backbone of the U.S. economy for quite some time. Um, so, and, and then the last thing is, who were the uh, economic competitors of the U.S. Mm -hmm. over the last hundred years? Europe and Japan. Both of them were decimated by major wars in the 20th century. So, so I think what it, when you look back on it, I think America tends to say it's the American dream, the American model, and democracy and soft power that made us what we are. And I think there are a lot of other factors, mostly in the U.S.'s favor, that have made us what we are. And now, for the first time, the U.S. is looking at someone who is co-equal in economic strength and momentum. And so I think we're now starting to see the U.S. move away from its historic notion of exceptionalism, that we are preordained to be the global leader indefinitely, to the reality check that our current model is not working for us at the government level. And certainly in relationship to developing countries and soft power, China, because it's doing real things, building infrastructure in these countries, has a much stronger relationship with a lot of the developing countries than the U.S. does. And the U.S. Is, can't just go out and say, we will support you, we're behind you. People are going to say, that's nice, but China is actually building our roads and bridges and tunnels. And that's more important for us right now. So I, I think the U.S. is at a turning point uh, in terms of recognizing that it's got to get its act together with the government. Mm -hmm. it's, got, it's got to give more room to businesses to be effective. And it has to move away from the isolationism that Trump created and engage, especially developing countries, in a constructive way. And those are all the things that China's been doing. And so... Uh, it's, yeah. it, to me, it's kind of a wake-up call for the U.S. So I think your description is very accurate. I think for the Chinese to be, quote, disillusioned with the American dream is just an accurate read of where we are at this point in time. I also think the U.S. has always been very resilient. It has great resources. It has amazing companies that dominate the global 500. So the U.S. has enormous assets to draw on. But right now, it's dysfunctional, largely because of the government. They are both having a lot of tasks that they need to accomplish within their own economy, within their own societies. Thank you so yes. much. Peter Walker, what a pleasure. Peter Walker, always a thinker on China-U.S. relations. You're watching World Inside. I'm Tianwei. Coming up in the program, Tea, philosophy of unity, a beautiful yard, and me. A deep and delightful conversation with David Bartosz about philosophical exchanges between China and Europe through centuries. Welcome back. This is World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. Learning a country's philosophy could be a great gateway of gaining deep understanding of its civilization. 
that's what David Bartosz told me when I was having tea with him and his friend in a traditional Chinese courtyard that he frequents in Beijing. The German scholar told me he learned from Chinese and German masters the big idea behind unity through differences. I love sitting there with him and his friend in that courtyard with piles of books around us, listening to chirping birds and watching restless cats purring by. I'm so glad to be in this courtyard. It's nice. The best part of the courtyard is that you have uh, fresh air all the time. And especially in the morning, you have uh, birds chirping, yes. and you have uh, the cats running. Around. Around. <laughs> <laughs> There's no wea <weird> here. <laughs> and we got great tea here. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So you want some tea? Uh, of course. Sure, okay. I thought yeah. you would offer, but you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a lot of uh, wonderful stuff over here, huh? Yeah, yeah. Mainly cultural heritage, intangible heritage. Maybe in the future we need to do more about yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the Hutong culture. Shijia Hutong Museum was my project, oh. Colin Chinner. Uh, Colin. He had a sound terminal project. He recorded sound of Hutong twice in my courtyard already. <laughs> Here, in this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you got to know each other for a long time? This so one? about maybe two years? Yeah, two years. Two or three, three years. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. We, we met from time to time also. Yeah, I've been invited uh, by Xinyu to uh, cultural gathering so yeah, yeah, sometimes yeah. there are friends here in the courtyard it's very uh, casual relaxed and yes. we, we talk about chinese culture civilization mm -hmm. about uh, all the topics uh, yeah, that's culture. nice i see you even has your book yes. how good a yeah. friend is that yes <laughs> <laughs> this, this was um uh, my big study comparative study on um uh, Wang Yaming okay. and a German philosopher of the 15th century called Nicholas Cousin. So they are almost at the same time. Almost right? of the same time. Mm -hmm. This is a mm -hmm. very. This is the most important thinker of the Ming Dynasty, yeah. and this is the most important thinker of the Renaissance. I know that you gather together with many of your friends here for yes. you know, events related to Chinese traditional culture. Exactly. Friends, uh, Chinese friends, but also foreign friends. Uh, we have met here on a regular basis and we spoke about Chinese culture. There's a revival, right? Yes, yes. About it's, it's curiosity amazing. and interest. Amazing. It's about, amazing. You know, it's what amazing. is going on right, in Chinese right. traditional culture. Right. It's amazing. It's, it's kind of a... I think tradition is not just about repeating the old stuff and what we see now it's there there is a kind of um, a merge or combination of uh, a revival of the ancient uh, elements of Chinese culture but it's also combined or fused with futuristic outlooks and I think this is the real meaning of tradition so to carry on the the cultural um, habits in a new form to transform and I, I think like this that, is particularly when I know that you had been researching about Wang Yangming, mm. which is one of the most well-known figures yes, yes. in China's uh, philosophy, particularly in Neo-Confucianism. Right, Tell right. me more, and our audience, okay. about who this person is. Why is he so significant? Okay, um, Wang Yangming uh, is the most important, I would say the most important pre-modern Chinese philosopher of the last 500 years, we might say. He's a Ming Dynasty thinker, very famous. Uh, he is very important for Chinese civilization, but we might even say for East Asian civilization as a whole, because he is a reformer in the Confucian tradition. He introduced new methods of self-cultivation, which became very, very important uh, since he has introduced them. Self-cultivation. He's been trying to link the mind and action, right. but not in a very simple sense, but rather how these two would interact exactly. and eventually have one individual being quote unquote self-cultivated. Exactly. To me, um, I have to uh, say first, uh, I'm, I'm from Germany and also Germany has a great philosophical culture. So uh, I was always fascinated by the Chinese philosophical tradition, which spans, we could say maybe uh, 2000, 3000 years. Uh, and um, I, I have seen that there are a lot of touching points. And the idea in Chinese is zhi xing he yi. So the unity of knowing and acting is very fascinating to me in particular because 
it adds something that is somehow a little bit lacking in, in the German uh, tradition. What is zhi xing he yi, first of all? First, I might have to explain what philosophy at its core, what philosophy is about. And uh, I think philosophy is striving to, for an insight of that which runs through everything and which runs everything. And this is something that cannot be put into words easily. It's not enough just to, to understand the core principle of the world. It's also important to, to realize it in action, in everyday life, to, to translate this understanding into our daily habits. And this is actually what Wang Yaming's approach is about. So many other philosophers have explained the world a lot or have, have tried to theorize. And Wang Yaming uh, is putting the finger in right to the problem that it's not enough to theorize it. We have to uh, translate, so to speak, this understanding that we gain in philosophy into real life action and uh, to enlighten, so to speak, all our activities, all our relationships. Mm -hmm. And uh, for Wang Yaming, it starts with the family. It starts with the relationship of uh, parents and children. One of the things it's very interesting about Wang Yaming, that is, he was, in fact, lying in a, a stone coffin right. for several days. Right, right. And he was trying to self-cultivate as to what is important and what is he thinking? Uh, why is he thinking relevant to what he's likely to do? Right. Tell this me more about that. This, ha this happened in, in Guizhou province, that uh, event, what, what you were talking about in Chinese tradition, it's called Wu Dao. So we might say the enlightenment, the, the, the extreme full understanding of the core principle that philosophers are striving to understand. And what Wang Yaming understood uh, in this context is that um, the subjective side of our existence, the xin, the mind, the heart mind, and the overall principle of self-organization of the universe, which in Chinese term is called li, so the, the self-organizing principle, they share the same wellspring. They, they come from the same root. So our subjective um, experience as an I in a certain, as a certain human being, and the overall principle of self-organization, they are connected, they are inseparable. And we can, in our daily problems, in our, uh, in, in our um, quest for understanding, we can always turn to that principle and we will, we can gain answers from there in a sort of intuitive uh, way. In plain words, actually your action can be directed by the core values that you have at heart. Exactly. You're born with, so to speak, born with a directionality, a directionality which is present in your consciousness. It's always there. It's, uh, it's like Wang Yaming says, it doesn't matter if you look at the sky through a window or if you are in an open field. It's always the same sky. It's and intuitive. It's intuitive, and you can always turn to that principle, which is also the connection between the so-called interior and the outer. Mm -hmm. Because actually, for Wang Yaming, the interior and the, the the interior and the outer are connect. They are part of the same Xin, the same mind. So for Wang Yaming, there's nothing outside of this right. heart mind. Mm -hmm. It's it's the heart mind is is a surface level where everything appears. It's you might uh, compare it to a mirror. U usually we, we see things appearing in the mirror, but we do not recognize the surface itself. So, and, and the heart mind is the surface. It's an infinite surface. In other words, he recognized that objects do not exist on their own. Exactly. But rather objects exist with the reflection of our mind. Why philosophy is relevant to us today? I think philosophy is tackling the big topics, the, the overview issues. I think that's the place of philosophy. And philosophy also provides at, at bottom or at, at the peak, so to speak, it provides a very fundamental insight which is shared in all great philosophies. 
at the same time, philosophy is also the reflection of cultural practices. So if I, as a German, I study Wang Yaming, it's a gateway for me to understand Chinese civilization, right? Because Wang Yaming, he was like a sponge. He absorbed ancient, several traditions, not just Confucianism. He absorbed Taoist, Buddhist, Mohist, so many, many uh, legalists, many, many traditions. He absorbed that, and through studying Wang Yaming, it, it's a, it, it can be a starting point. It's an entry point. An for entry you. point, and at the same time, it's also an entry point to the future because, also in the 20th century and the 21st century, uh, Wang Yaming's thought it has been very influential in China, also in politics. For example, Sun Jun Shan, he was very fond of Wang Yaming, and also. Uh, many, many leaders after that always have read Wyoming's books um, and also President Xi has, has emphasized the importance of Wang Yaming. So it is also important in terms of understanding modern China and also to see the relevance of these traditions and how they are transformed into new mm. understandings. And last not least, it's also a bridge, right, in East Asia because, for example, Japan, Japanese culture and civilization has been very much influenced by Wang Yaming, right? So, so there's also yeah. a, a, a great opportunity for the communication between civilizations. This is uh, the reason why we talk about a philosophy, philosophical issue, yes. is because that we really need it today, as you just said. But to you, um, what kind of door did it open for you when you were in China? Oh, it opened uh, many doors, not just one. Um, I started out as uh, studying Wang Yaming from a comparative perspective. So I studied Wang Yaming uh, against the background of German philosophy tradition. There were two doors. So um, because when you do comparative research, the most important thing is to look at the differences, the analytical differences. Right. So to understand both sides better, you have to distinguish the, the core aspects. So and, and this comparison helped me to get closer to the horizon of Wang Yaming's philosophy uh, and, and the way how it is really meant in the Chinese tradition, not to project my own backgrounds on, on that, on, on, on this tradition. And on the other hand, it also, looking at Wang Yaming, then also helped me to see other things in my own tradition. So comparing, learning from both sides also helps you to, to preserve and understand better your own uh, first backgrounds, and now I, I would say I have two, at least mm -hmm. two backgrounds, and from there, of course, having uh, two perspectives, two basic fundamental ways of seeing the world uh, is, is much better than having just one opportunity to look at the world, and from there you I can... I love that. Can I love that. Tell me more about these two different fundamental ways of looking at the world. I especially in the case of German philosophy and Chinese philosophy, uh, the uh, it's, it's not uh, completely uh, different. There are many, many touching points, as I said before. First of all, the great masters in the German tradition and masters in the Chinese tradition, uh, they reach the same core level of understanding. W we might call that the understanding of unity through difference. Mm. I love that. Right? In Chinese tradition, you have our Butong, for example, which is an expression of that. Um, but it's much... Exactly, and in a, a German tradition, Hegel, for example, he, he speaks about the unity of unity and difference. So core or, or Fichte, he talks about uh, the unity through difference, and, and the idea goes also back to ancient Greek philosophy. And it's also influenced by Chinese thinking, I, I, I guess, um, or, or, or there is a certain kind of resonance mm -hmm. since uh, also the Age of Enlightenment, uh, because our the founder, so to speak, of, of, the, of the modern uh, philosophy tradition, German philosophy tradition, uh, goes by the name of Christian Wolf. Mm -hmm. So a very important starting point after the Thirty Years' War period in the 18th century, beginning of the 18th century, was Christian Wolf. And this man, he turned to Confucian tradition. He was very much inspired by Chinese thinking and therefore um, introduced some new thoughts that he came up with in the context with um, directing his thought to Chinese tradition. For example, he gave an inaugural lecture, I think in 1722 in the city of Halle and talking about the Chinese Confucian principles of governance mm. that early. So, so this is a very important moment for, for our tradition as well. Actually, what you just said is very enlightening in oh, a way. Thank you. <laughs> Because 
now we think about the differences. There are debates, right? But there's political debate, yeah. human rights debate, yes. philosophical debate. But actually, if we trace it back to our origin, there were a lot of similarities because they were of each other's inspiration. I have to add something. I, my, my answer was also not complete uh, beforehand. There is another important thing. You asked me what are the differences and also the similarities. Um, we also have to see that we start from, as human beings, we start from uh, the same basic fundamental problems. We have to remind ourselves about that. We have the same basic questions. Uh, and f the different uh, traditions, sometimes they found similar solutions, but sometimes they also found dissimilar solutions. But this, this is not um, uh, bad or wrong. And on the contrary, it's a good thing to have the more solutions we have in our backpack, the humankind's backpack, the more possibilities we have to solve our upcoming and future problems. Th there's so much useful insight from the centuries, the thousands of years before that we can tap into uh, and there's so much potential. So why should we diminish that potential? And uh, another thing is a big mistake that many people are making today is they mix the analysis of the differences with evaluating the differences. Mm -hmm. I think it's, in my opinion, in terms of philosophy, it's very hard to evaluate the differences because we don't have an observer independent point of view. So how do how Meaning can I decide we are all influenced by our own culture. Exactly. How can I decide if another culture's achievements are better or not as good as the w ones that I have been socialized right. with or in the context I have been socialized all of these with the product. are terrific points. I think yes. it's really worth a lot of thinking today. So we have to analyze, we have to understand each other, but we should abstain from from judging too early. That's what already Leibniz said. Another a uh, philosopher of the European Enlightenment, German thinker, he said, with regard to China, especially with regard to China, he emphasized, he said, we should study China first. We should study everything, but we should abstain from evaluating it because we, we first we have to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very wise approach which a lot of people should think about uh, when they make judgments much too early. They, they should s first you have to understand what you're talking <laughs> about, right? <laughs> we have been talking a lot, the debates regarding individual rights versus collective rights and responsibilities. This is reflected in the period of the pandemic, particularly mm -hmm. about the masks, about the vaccines, oh, yeah, and a all of this. Important topic, yeah. Mm. And, and there seems to be some relevance in studying fundamental relevance, yes. About what exactly is individuals' intuitiveness exactly vis a vis exactly. collectively yes. the capabilities. How do you see that after studying Wang Yangming in comparison with some German philosophical traditions? Oh, that's a very, very good question. I think there's a touching point uh, between, for example, between Wang Yangming and uh, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel's talk about morality. Mm -hmm. There's a certain kind of very close relationship in this part um, of the two philosophies. And both thinkers, they have understood that actually the so-called other is actually a reflection of, of, of our own self. So yes. Wang Yaming very much emphasizes uh, that if we make, if we separate an I and a you, if we separate that in the mind, we are not in accord with the good knowing which we are born with. We are not in accord with the Tao. We are not in accord, we are not in balance. Mm -hmm. Our willing is in Chinese is zi si zi li, so it's selfish. It becomes selfish. It's it's self-centered, and uh, therefore we diminish ourselves. And uh, the true uh, way of developing our inborn moral capabilities is to uh, to understand that uh, actually we are all expressions of the same core principle. At bottom, we are not separate. And um, Wyoming also emphasizes that our shin forms one, he calls, we might translate this as body, one body mm -hmm. with heaven, earth, and a 10,000 things. It's, so it's not just about, it's not even just about humans, it's also about animal mm. ethics, so to speak. We could say it's also about uh, 
protecting the environment. Wang Yaming uh, speaks about uh, the vulnerability of animals. We have to recognize them for being also the same carriers of cosmic life, plants, plant life, and even natural uh, surroundings. Mm. As Leibniz said, we have to ignite one light at the other. Right, the I love European, that. European tradition and the Chinese tradition, they have to ignite each other. And that's it, it, actually what they're doing for hundreds of years. Yes. They're already doing it, but we have to become consci more conscious of this, of this and process. And be able to do that ourselves, too. Exactly, in our individual uh, existence. That's, I think that's the starting point. The investigation of our situations with people is the starting point to, um, to bring the world back into equilibrium. But for Wang Yaming, it has to start with us. So it cannot be, it cannot be um, just one person. Yeah, it cannot be introduced from above as a theoretical principle. It also has to come from our own selves, and we have to be enabled to study and to search for it. So that's why, for example, China, the poverty alleviation is so important. That uh, if if you're too poor, you don't have time or the opportunity to to right. cultivate yourself. But if that problem is solved individually, the next step is. Uh, the, to see the responsibility, not just for ourselves, but for the whole world, that we have to cultivate ourselves individually. What a beautiful time we spent in the traditional Chinese courtyard, listening to the philosophical exchanges between China and Germany. And that's all we have for today. If you'd like to see more search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Pian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. 